Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, COVID-19, Moving Money to the Streets, Steps to Get CDBG Dollars Working Locally. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You have joined the webinar using your computer's speaker system by default. Due to the high capacity of this webinar event, computer audio will be used in today's session rather than a phone dial-in option. You will have an opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing them into the questions pane in your control panel. You may send in your questions at any time and we will address them during the Q&A session. I would now like to introduce Eric Collins, Director of Montgomery County Community and Economic Development. Welcome, Eric. Hey, thank you very much, and uh, welcome to uh, to all the attendees uh, from around the country. We have a lot of participants today, and we have a really great panel uh, to talk about uh, getting community development uh, funds out on the street. Uh, again, my name is Eric Collins, and uh, we're excited that you were all able to join us uh, in how we can mobilize those CDBG funds. Really, it's a topic that's really extremely important to all of our members and a reminder to our participants and, and as Emily said, the record, this uh, webinar will in fact be recorded uh, and all the slides will be available on the IEDC COVID-19 webinar page within 24 hours of today. Uh, I also like to remind all the participants that you can actually type in your questions uh, into the questions tab on your GoToWebinars dashboard and representatives from IDC will be standing by. So our premise today uh, really is that states and communities are, are uh, going to be getting roughly $5 billion around the country. And, and I think the key is how can we deploy that money into the communities because we, we don't really have a lot of time. Uh, companies, uh, regular citizens, they need help and they need help, they need help now. And so that's one of the goals here today is, is kind of from an outcome standpoint. What can each of you do take, uh, taking away from this uh, webinar on how you can get your block grant funds uh, out on the street to make an impact in your, in your community? So we have, uh, as we go through uh, today's webinar and we have our, our panelists speak towards the end, I'll entertain, uh, we'll have questions and you can type those questions in on the chat feature here on the on the GoToWebinar. Uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, read each of the bios uh, and then I'll turn it over to our first speaker, uh, uh, Stan Gimmett, uh, who will be talking about uh, kind of re uh, reliable funding conduits and, and uh, many other topics that I'll, I'll get into here in a moment. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share with you the bios of our distinguished panel. Uh, we have great panelists from around the country, and uh, I think these, these are the leaders uh, uh, working with community development block grants. So our first uh, panelist, uh, and welcome Stan, and welcome panelists, uh, is Stan Gimmant, uh, who is a Senior Advisor for Community Recovery with Haggerty. Uh, Stan has 32 years of service with the U.S. Department of Urban Development, Housing and Urban Development, and he provides a lot of strategic advisory support focused on HUD programs, including housing and long-term community recovery. From August of 16 to July of 19, he served as HUD's Deputy Assistant Secretary for grant programs, and in his role, he provided management direction and oversight for all aspects of community development block grant funding. Uh, that also included home investment partnership uh, program funding, uh, long-term uh, disaster recovery, also known as CDBG-DR, uh, and then also work with the National Housing Trust Fund. Uh, so he uh, has a, a long history, good depth of knowledge, uh, and I think it's also worth noting that when he served uh, with HUD as director of HUD's Office of Block Grant Assistance from 08 to 16, he managed about $60 billion in federal funding to assist the nation's communities in addressing housing development and disaster recovery. Uh, Stan has uh, received the Presidential Award in recognition from HUD uh, in 2015, and he holds uh, a BA and MPA 
from George Washington University and a master's degree in real estate development from Johns Hopkins. So welcome, Stan, and we're, we're glad that you're on the panel. Uh, our next speaker then will be uh, Scott uh, Farron. And uh, Scott, we're, we're so glad that you're able to, to be with us here today. Uh, Scott uh, is certainly busy with all the all the legislation and, and working on uh, some of the bills that are that are underway. And Scott Farron is the Financial Services Con uh, Counsel for the U.S. Congressman Congresswoman Joyce Beatty uh, and staffs uh, in Ohio and staffs uh, her both on the Joint Economic Committee and the House Financial Service Co Services Committee, including the Subcommittee on Housing, Community Development, and Insurance. Uh, prior to Scott joining the Congresswoman's office, he actually worked as an in-house attorney for a military contractor in McLean, Virginia. He is a graduate of George Washington University Law School, uh, during which he was a law clerk in the U.S. Department of justice. So uh, welcome, Scott. We're glad that you're able to join join us today. Our next uh, presenter, our panelist, is uh, Sue Southen. Uh, she is a senior technical specialist, uh, ICF International out of Bloomfield uh, Hills, Michigan. And she is a development professional and trainer and strategic planner with over 35 years of experience in community economic development and affordable uh, housing production. Uh, she's managed several technical assistance engagements for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development in states including Michigan, where she provided senior expertise on program design, organizational structure, and staffing recruitment uh, requirements, including budget development, regulatory, regulatory compliance, and underwriting. Uh, she served as a trainer for the International Economic Development uh, Council Professional Certification Program, uh, the Economic Development Institute, and the Association of Workforce Boards. Uh, boards. She uh, holds a bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Michigan. So uh, welcome, Sue, and thanks for being here on the panel today. Our, our final panelist uh, will be Raquel Favela. She's the Senior Director with the National Development Council uh, located in New York City. Uh, she rejoined uh, NDC after uh, serving in a turnaround management role with the City of Dallas as the Chief Economic Development and Neighborhood Services, uh, providing executive leadership in five departments, including planning and urban design, housing and uh, uh, neighborhood revitalization, economic development, code compliance, and fair housing, human rights as well. She has over uh, 20 years of experience working with government and with uh, municipal, state, and federal levels, including uh, meeting economic development goals. So uh, she has a lot of experience. She has exceptional knowledge of all aspects of local government, state, and federal financing tools, and is nationally recognized expert in housing and economic development. Today, she's going to talk a lot about some of the, the programs uh, that you can take advantage of and uh, that NDC is working on to assist uh, communities and uh, companies uh, throughout the United States. Uh, her unique brand of expertise in financing and real estate uh, development join her long-range planning acumen uh, to really bring balanced problem solving to communities. And I think in our prep uh, with all the panelists, uh, one thing that I took away, and I think all of you will take away, are some real practical types of applications uh, so that you can be more effective uh, in your respective communities around the country. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn it over to Stan Gimmett, uh, and he is going to talk about the basics, of, uh, the basics here and, and things that we all need to know about CDBG, uh, developing that reliable funding conduit, the CARES Act funding, some aspects of HUD actions to date and what's to come, and then finally, some deployment considerations that, that all of us should kind of take, take to heart. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Stan. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, I'm Stan Gimont, the Senior Advisor for Community Recovery with Haggerty Consulting. Uh, which is an emergency management and uh, disaster uh, recovery firm. 
and uh, I am happy to be here this afternoon to uh, talk about a, a topic uh, uh, that, that I know uh, very well, the Community Development Block Grant Program, having uh, run the program from 2008 to uh, 2019. So uh, what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about the basics here uh, and set a foundation for the uh, discussion uh, on this webinar. Uh, and uh, again, try and set the stage for, uh, for a good discussion. So um, let's see, trying to advance to my next slide. Uh, I'm a little fast there. Okay, so uh, I'd like to uh, cover four points. Uh, CDBG as a reliable funding conduit. Why does Congress choose this option? Uh, to deliver funding to state and local government for these uh, sort of events. I want to talk a bit specifically about the CARES Act funding under the CDPG heading. Uh, what HUD's done to date and uh, what is yet to come with uh, regard to the uh, use of these funds. And then some deployment considerations based on the uh, number of years of experience having dealt with supplemental appropriations uh, through the CDBG structure, uh, try to put on the table a few things for, for everyone to think about as they uh, try to digest this funding uh, going forward. So with that, uh, CDBG as a reliable funding conduit. So uh, many of you are aware that the Community Development Block Grant Program has been around since 1974. And uh, at this point, uh, from a, you know, provides funding to more than 1,200 jurisdictions around the country on an annual basis. Back when the program began in the mid-70s, there was a little under 600 jurisdictions. Uh, now it's well over 1,200 and, it, and uh, adding a few more every year. So what this means is that there is a constant annual flow of funds through this program, which means it, by, con in, by extension, the local familiars local officials are really familiar with all of the uh, operational environment that goes along with CDBG. They understand the framework, they understand the systems, they understand the basic program requirement. So in that sense, CDBG is a great program to begin to deliver dollars, additional funding down there to the state and local level to deal with a uh, specific problem that, uh, uh, that has arrived on the scene, and in this case, being uh, the coronavirus. So uh, within CDBG, of course, there are a range of activities under the statute, 26 different eligible activities defined, uh, but uh, HUD generally groups them and looks at them in, in a handful of buckets, uh, be they infrastructure and public facilities, housing-oriented activities, economic development, and public services. And since you have this wide range of uh, activities that you can carry out under the program, uh, CDBG is real useful uh, for addressing a lot of different needs and addressing a bunch of gaps. Always keeping in mind that CDBG can be used as matching funds to other federal programs, which may end up being a very you know, valuable uh, characteristic of CDBG uh, COVID funding as we move forward over the next few months. Yeah, and for those instances where you may be receiving uh, other funding uh, through the federal government that in fact requires state or local match. Um, the uh, appropriation of additional funding for CDBG uh, to address uh, needs associated with the coronavirus is a bit of an extension of Congress's action to deliver emergency and recovery funding through the program. Uh, and as we look back over uh, the last two decades or so, more than $90 billion has been appropriated for supplemental disaster recovery funding under the program since 2001. Uh, many of you may recall about a decade ago when HUD was uh, actively involved in addressing the, uh, the housing crisis, 2008-2010, and uh, the, pro the department stood up in very rapid fashion the uh, neighborhood stabilization program uh, for $7 billion. Uh, and then there was also the billion dollar additional appropriation in 2009 under the Recovery Act uh, 
uh, where those funds were directed specifically to CDBG purposes. So you can see a pattern here in Congress uh, opting to use that CDBG framework uh, as a way to deliver that money down to the state and local level. And, and concurrent with that, Congress gives HUD authority to uh, waive and uh, uh, establish alternative requirements to many of the basic uh, 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 statutory uh, requirements of the program, and HUD uses that funding or that responsibility in a fairly judicious manner. Well, on this slide, I would like to make one, uh, one quick change uh, where it says 5 million and 3.4 million up there at the top. That should be 5 billion and 3.4 billion. Uh, but, uh, you know, what's, what's a few commas, what's a common and a few zeros among friends? But nonetheless, uh, the CARES Act provides uh, uh, a total of $5 billion for, this, for CDBG purposes. Uh, and that stands in contrast to the annual funding for the program at $3.4 billion. So uh, ultimately, there will be more money moving through the program in response to uh, uh, coronavirus than we see on the uh, annual funding for uh, CDBG. So uh, in appropriating those dollars, uh, Congress uh, provided direction to HUD to allocate that money in three tranches. The initial $2 billion was allocated to all grantees, and they were directed to do that within 30 days of enactment, which would have been effectively uh, not later than uh, April 26, 2020. Um, today's the 20th. Uh, these funds have already been allocated, and we'll talk a bit more about that uh, on the next slide. The next step that HUD is to take is to allocate $1 billion to states and territories not later than uh, May 11th. Uh, based on factors identified in the CARE Act, as well as uh, additional factors that HUD may develop uh, for that particular formula. Finally, uh, the uh, CARES Act directs HUD to allocate $2 billion on a rolling basis uh, to states or local governments at the discretion of the Secretary according to a formula based on factors determined by the Secretary. So this is a, a very significant amount of money that is yet to come. It is unclear exactly how HUD will uh, address that on a, quote, rolling basis, end quote. Uh, but my suspicion would be HUD won't hang on to that money terribly long, uh, given the uh, number of uh, calls for additional assistance to the state and local government level. This would be a uh, an, an additional uh, Stop gap in the short term where the money has already been appropriated. So, uh, if, if I were a betting man, I would say that HUD will probably move relatively quickly to move through those dollars and allocate them. The CARES Act also provides a range of relief on statutory provisions. I think the two most important uh, things that it does uh, specifically is it removes the cap on public services expenditures and it extends a number of different flexibilities to uh, the use of grantees regular or annual allocation from 2019 and 2020. With regard to the public service cap, uh, the statute in effect uh, imposes a 15% limitation on, on annual funds for grantees. CARES Act removes that with respect to expenditures in support of uh, uh, addressing needs associated with coronavirus and it extends that also into the 19 and 20 funding. So that is a big point of flexibility for many, uh, many of the grantees out there across the country. It also uh, makes it much easier to uh, do amendments uh, and create new action plans to address the use of these funds. So those are just a couple of the uh, highlights from the CARES Act uh, regulatory provisions. Um, so what has HUD, do, HUD done to date with regard to CARES Act funding? So as we noted, uh, the initial $2 billion allocation was announced on April 2nd. The link there will take you to a page where you can see the uh, uh, spreadsheet that has allocations for all CDBG grantees across the country of that initial $2 billion. That spreadsheet will also show you uh, funding that was allocated to uh, other grantees uh, or, or to these 
or a subset of these grantees for uh, emergency solution grants, which are part of the HUD consolidated plan process. And so you will see both of those allocations as well as funding under the HOPWA program you know, for, for grantees for, that qualify for that funding. So a uh, useful link there to go look at that, that uh, particular spreadsheet to see how that funding has been allocated. Again, that is based pretty much on a takeoff of the uh, annual funding uh, formulas in the statute. Uh, HUD did issue uh, some extended guidance uh, late on April 9th with regard to uh, interpretations on CARE Act flexibilities with a few waivers there as well as some some detail uh, with regard to uh, uh, how some of these provisions that are in the CARES Act are in effect self-implementing and directing grantees to move forward in the short term. Again, talks about the five-day public comment period for uh, substantial amendments and new action plans. Uh, discusses a bit the uncapped public service expenditures, uh, directs grantees to begin to move as soon as possible, not waiting for the additional $3 billion to be allocated. Um, uh, which discusses the combination of the, of the 1920 funds, and it discusses, discusses uh, uh, the issuance of a Federal Register notice with additional waivers and alternative requirements. So there, in the middle of the page with the to come actions, there was a discussion of that Federal Register notice. Not clear exactly what HUD is going to put in there at this point in time, but I suspect they're going to move uh, relatively quickly on trying to get that out to provide more definition with regard to the use of these dollars. Again, the second tranche of money is to be announced by May 11th, targeted to states and territories, and then tranche three allocations are going to come down the road at some point. But again, uh, if I had to guess, I don't think that they will hang on to it very long. So uh, we'll see some sort of allocation, uh, uh, maybe not in the next uh, few weeks, but uh, I would think uh, shortly thereafter. So uh, that's just my interpretation of, of how they might look at it. Uh, no guarantees with regard to timing there. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Deployment considerations. So, um, having uh, dealt with any of a number of grantees over many years with regard to supplemental funding, be it disaster recovery, be it neighborhood stabilization, um, it's important to kind of put these dollars into their context. And uh, so, let me just highlight a few considerations that have been important for me over time. Uh, one is to take action only with career, clear direction and plan. So you want to ask yourself, what are your community needs and how can you use these dollars to address them? Um, key piece of this puzzle is understanding what are the other funding sources that may be coming your way. Some programs have a very, very narrow, very specific use. CDBG is more flexible in that way. So make informed choices that uh, layer your funding and balance that flexibility that you do have uh, inherent to your CDBG dollars. Uh, also, to the extent that you are using uh, or potentially going to seek some reimbursement from FEMA under its uh, disaster recovery fund through its uh, public assistance program, beware of the duplication of benefit issue, where uh, an entity, and in this case, a, a local, state or local government, is prohibited from receiving funding for the same uh, uh, same activity for the same purpose from both funding sources. Prioritize how you're going to do this and be careful on how you approach uh, uh, the mixing and matching of FEMA funding uh, when you're seeking reimbursement uh, under the uh, Disaster Recovery Fund. Um, consider what your own uh, organizational strengths and weaknesses are here. What can you accomplish with the staff you have? My guess is many of you have been running at the, at the red line for a few weeks. It's going to continue on like that. So the question becomes, what can you, what can you get done uh, with the folks that you do have? Um, inform that further by uh, looking at where do you have appropriate uh, controls, policies, procedures uh, from existing programs that you can bring to bear on the use of the uh, uh, the CV dollars 
uh, to the extent you want to try and do something that may be a bit out of the box or a bit out of the ordinary for your regular CDBG program. Try to build off of what you already know. Uh, and when you're thinking about what actions to take, um, you're going to need additional staff because you just can't handle this additional influx of money and all the things that are going on around you with just the folks you have. Remember that there's an administrative allowance that comes along with CDBG. Use that to your utmost effect to make sure that you uh, are able to get the folks that you need to have uh, to uh, effectively administer the money. Always be mindful of uh, you know, applicable requirements as well as public optics in the use of these dollars. Um, you know, there is no relief here uh, at this point in time from HUD with regard to low moderate income benefit requirements, you have to continue to uh, keep your eye on those uh, uh, those standards and when you use your funds uh, design programs that are gonna meet those requirements, unless HUD may change them in the Federal Register Notice. Uh, concurrently, think about how your actions appear to the taxpaying public and those suffering economic hardship. So uh, when you have to make decisions, think long and hard about something that if, it, if you wouldn't want to see it on the front page of the paper or the, the test some people used to use, if you didn't want to see it on 60 Minutes on Sunday evening, uh, maybe you want to back off of that activity. But think about what you're going to do and how it appears to the public. Uh, having worked for HUD for so many years, I would urge you to always talk to your HUD representatives if you have questions and you need uh, uh, further relief or information. Uh, but when you do deal with them, uh, present your position and ask why not, uh, as opposed to just asking, is this okay? Uh, make an argument for what you want to do, and I think that you can get a good reception from, uh, from your HUD colleagues. So with that, uh, appreciate it, and uh, I'll turn it back over. Thank you, Stan. Uh, great comments, uh, really good overview, and some good, good takeaways for, for the uh, – people listening today. Uh, Stan, I, I can't underscore enough uh, what you said at the end, too, of how important it is to to reach out to your CPD rep um, in the field office uh, for questions, technical assistance, et cetera. Also, I'd like to just add that those uh, links that you provided that will be on the IDC website tomorrow will be great great links and resources for, for everyone. Stan, maybe there's one thing uh, before we transition over to Scott is uh, is that can you confirm that the HUD uh, has provided a waiver opportunity for the citizen participation and public comment period to five days? Is that that's the way I understand? Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so uh, they issued uh, a memo dated uh, April 9th that. Uh, is entitled CARES Act Flexibility for CDBG Funds Used to Support Coronavirus. It can be accessed via um, uh, the HUD Exchange, HUD Exchange dot, uh, uh, oh, what is, dot info. HUD Exchange dot info is the portal for all the technical assistance, and you will find a lot of information there that uh, would be useful. And you'll find links to all these various documents that HUD has been issuing. Uh, with regard to CDBG as well as the ESG program. Um, but uh, the, there is relief here with regard to uh, the, uh, uh, the five-day period. And just reading from the cover memo, it says the guide describes the immediate availability of a five-day public comment period for amendments and new plan submissions. Uh, and then it goes on to talk about other, other requirements as well that are changed. But, that is clearly uh, front and center from HUD's standpoint, five-day uh, public comment period. Thank you, Stan. And this really kind of aligns with what how we we started the, today's panel, is that how can we get CDBG monies out on the street faster in the community? So, so I thought so that was worth highlighting, and thanks for elaborating on that uh, more. Sure. Uh, now I'd like to, uh, to transition over to Scott Farnan, uh, Scott is the uh, with Financial Services Council for U.S. Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, and uh, Scott is going to really provide some additional color to the nuances of the bill uh, and what's currently in the pipeline on Capitol Hill. 
basically talk about how the sausage was made and discuss you know, really what's in the bill uh, that we're talking about. So Scott, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you and, and thank you very much. Thanks, Eric. Um, let me start off by first thanking the staff of the International Economic Development Council uh, for organizing the event, having me today, and for you know putting these on, putting these events on with other experts like uh, Stan, Sue, and Raquel. Um, I think these are invaluable, especially in the circumstances we face today, uh, to help provide guidance to members on how we can quickly and efficiently deploy these funds from the coffers of the federal government and onto the street, so to speak, um, to help our families, our neighbors, our communities um, across the country. Uh, as Eric said, I, I currently work on Capitol Hill for a senior member of the House Financial Services Committee, U.S. Congresswoman Joyce Beatty. Uh, she's also a member of the Housing and Community Development uh, and Insurance Subcommittee, which has direct oversight over HUD and programs like the Community Development Block Grant Program. I'm going to talk a little bit about the about the CARES Act, uh, Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, um, which, as we know, includes five billion dollars for the CDBG program. Uh, also, want to take a couple minutes to talk about some other provisions of the bill, um, as well as what maybe we can expect next, and then how you all can be helpful to members of Congress um, when it comes to deploying this money. Um, because you know when you when you try to sit down and write a bill like the CARES Act, you know obviously hundreds of staffers worked on it, um, but when you're talking about getting trillions of dollars out into the hands of the public, um, you know the first problem that you're going to tackle is distribution and how can you use existing vehicles to get that money out in a responsible way or is responsibly as you can. I, this is an unprecedented amount of money that went out in this last bill, um, and we'll likely see a another large package being moved here soon. Um, so, for instance, you know, Congress kind of used the banks uh, to get small business loans out um, into the hands of small business owners because they had the greatest reach and, and existing capacity to do so. Um, you know, they used the IRS to get cash into the hands of people directly because they had, you know, bank account numbers for 90 million Americans already. Um, and, you know, CDBG likewise is a, it's a proven vehicle to distribute money wild, widely into the hands of our localities across the country. Um, so when Congress enacted, uh, when Congress usually enacts supplemental appropriations like the one that uh, the CBG money in the CARES Act, it's usually done under the auspices of the CBG Disaster Recovery Program, uh, which we've seen deployed in responses to um, natural disasters, hurricanes like Hurricane Harvey, Irma, and Maria in 2017. Um, and I think that, that the experience that uh, members had with the CDBG DR program um, and some of the administrative um, hiccups uh, with getting money into the field as quickly as possible due to you know having HUD having to do a rulemaking process for each one of those programs I think that was definitely top of mind for members um, when it came to utilizing CDPG this go around and purposefully not requiring a rulemaking or going a CDPG DR route um, because the ultimate goal is to get money into the hands of Americans as quickly as possible or into localities hands as quickly as possible to help deal with this crisis. Um, so the CARES Act, as, as Stan mentioned, um, two, billion, 2 billion of the five uh, was allocated, uh, was announced shortly after um, the bill was passed and signed into law um, in a proportionality with existing allocations um, with another one billion um, also to be given out um, for specifically for hard harder hit areas. And then another two billion that'll be on its way here soon. Um, 
you know, I think as Stan said, HUD is likely to move that money quickly uh, because they know, I mean, they know it's needed, but also because there will certainly be congressional pressure and oversight um, to try to get that money um, on the street as, as quick as possible. Um, one of the, some of the other provisions I, I thought would be good to just highlight, um, I know a lot of, we have a diverse um, attendee audience here. Um, some of them may serve multiple hats. Um, in their positions. Uh, there was also $150 billion in the CARES Act for states and territories and tribal governments. Um, under this provision, each state will receive funds to supplement lost revenue costs uh, incurred due to the coronavirus based on population with uh, a minimum for states of uh, at least uh, uh, $1.25 billion um, per state, and any local government will also be able to uh, get a direct award from uh, Treasury, from the federal government, if they have more than 500,000 people um, in their populations uh, to try to get money into the hands of the cities and counties where the transmission of the virus um, you know, may, be more, may be more likely in those populous areas um so that's kind of where we are uh with with, with the cares act it, it it did take um you know some time to put together however for being the largest bill that i think congress ever has um passed it came together very quickly um you know, we're talking about over two trillion dollars worth of money there will certainly be hiccups but um, I think that uh, it's, it, it was impressive uh, how quickly it came together. And, you know, so, so what's next? Um, this week, Congress will likely pass another, another bill um, to replenish some of the programs in the CARES Act. I think the way that members are describing this upcoming bill is not a phase four coronavirus or a package or a CARES 2.0 act. It's more of a, an interim bill that uh, really sole purpose is to replenish some of the funds that were exhausted um, already from the CARES Act, uh, specifically uh, the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, there will probably be another $300 billion or so dollars for, for that program another 50 billion for the emergency injury disaster loan program, uh, another 75 billion for our hospitals, um, hopefully another 25 billion for testing. Um, and altogether this will be about 450 billion or so. Um, that seems to be the consensus of where things are heading. Uh, members uh, could be voting as early as tomorrow, as Wednesday. Um, and, you know, if I'm off by a few billion on what the total comes, please don't hold it against me. Um, you know, only in Congress could you say that, you know, if I'm just off by a few billion, it's a, it's a rounding error. Um, unfortunately, while, you know, it doesn't look like we were able to get more money for funding for states and localities in this package, I, I mean, I definitely can see every day that it's still a top priority for many members of Congress on both sides of the aisle um, for a fourth package. Um, like I said, coronavirus, it doesn't know any boundaries. It's affecting states and localities, no matter if it's a red state or a blue state. Um, so, you know, as we come back into session this week to pass the, that bill, you'll likely see negotiations start to ramp up for a fourth coronavirus package when uh, members are due back on May 4th. Um, although to be honest, negotiations will likely start sometime this week after the interim bill passes, um, just because there really has been no rest for the weary on Capitol Hill um, when you're talking about these large amounts of money and a lot of these new programs that are being stood up for the first time. Um, so moving forward, 
I just want to take a minute to, 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 you know, tell people on the call who would be administrating some of these CDBG dollars, um, how they can be helpful um, to Congress. Um, and, you know, in my experience working on the Hill and working on the House Financial Services Housing Subcommittee, uh, there are, uh, you know, two things that really get under the skin of members on both sides of the aisle more than anything else with regards to CDBG money. Um, and that's really uh, specific towards CDBG money issued during, you know, a disaster. And that's really uh, things like waste and funds sitting on the sidelines of bank accounts. Um, I still hear stories on the Hill from some in the Louisiana delegation about uh, funds from the Hurricane Katrina um, CDB GDR uh, program that are still unspent um, all these years later. You know, I think in, in the eyes of Congress, uh, you know, most members want this money to be put to work as fast as possible and as responsibly as possible. Uh, I know that's a fine line and a balancing act, which is why I think Today's webinar is, you know, important to help provide guidance on how to implement these funds and, and how important it is to, you know, get the money out on the street. Um, I'd say one thing to keep in mind uh, with this money is that the CARES Act did establish a special oversight committee to be a watchdog over the trillions of dollars that were allocated in this bill. You know, while the five billion dollars in the CDBG program is only a small sliver of the overall funds. Um, when you add the oversight of the HUD Inspector General uh, that reports to Congress, and you know the fact that this current administration has uh, sent several budget requests to Congress to zero out funding for the CDBG pro program altogether, um, it's incredibly important not to give any of CDBG detractors any ammunition to. You know, reduce CDBG funding in years ahead outside of a disaster. And I think the best way, um, you know, to, to help guard against that is to, is to work with your communities, get, get this money out as, as quickly as possible, but also as responsibly as possible. Um, there certainly doesn't seem to be a lack of places to put the money. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, the purpose and the benefit of the community block grants, community development block grants, is that uh, the funds you know, are used to address specialized local needs in a way that many attendees on this call know way better than the federal government ever could. Um, and I think that's why it's such a successful program. And um, hopefully, uh, I think Congress certainly expects that um, the five billion will be spent um, very well and is in good hands um, is going to be able to help a lot of people um, thanks to a lot of the work that are, people on this call are going to be doing over the next couple of weeks so uh, with that said I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there and uh, take questions at the end thanks Scott, thank you that was uh, a really good overview and uh, I think you know, kind of like I said at the beginning when I was introducing you, kind of how was how was the sausage made, and uh, you know what's in the bill. And I think all of us, all of us around the country, kind of you know, understand there are so many resources out there. How do you sift through the resources? What's eligible? What's not eligible? And I think all of us have to make sure that we're 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 really attuned to obviously things like this webinar, but also uh, you know, staying close to your to your reps and to uh, looking at uh, RestoreYourEconomy.org uh, from IEDC as they continue to put really good information on there. So thank, thanks again, Scott. And I think with that, we've got a, a really good transition because here we have all, all this money that's been appropriated uh, and now we've got to spend it. And we need to make sure that we have a good structure plan to spend that money uh, appropriately and uh, quickly. And Sue Southen uh, is going to provide us a variety of, of case studies of really how communities have used
CDBG monies and then how really to deploy them. And I think the big thing is, you know, how do you get that money out on the street? And she is going to provide a, a great uh, overview of a plan that each of you, you might want to take a close look at uh, for your, your local community. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sue Southen, and she's the Senior Technical Specialist with ICF International. Thanks, Sue. Thanks, Eric. I appreciate that. And, and actually, you're you're right. The uh, Stan and Scott have really set a great stage for this. Um, it's my pleasure to be here with you today. And I will have to tell you that um, my charge from Jeff Fankel when he asked me to help with this webinar was to tell folks how to get the money on the street and fast. So while I know some of you don't think of CDBG Community Development Block Grant and even CDBG DR or our new CDBG CB as a quickly deployable resource. In this instance, as Stan referenced, HUD has already provided a number of waivers to help states and entitlements, those communities that get their allocations directly from HUD, to move quickly to access um, the funding to address local needs. The graphic you see here illustrates six steps that I would suggest grantees conduct to make critical decisions about how to use the resources HUD has provided and will continue to provide through the additional $3 billion that's been referenced earlier. And yes, it is possible and even likely that you can get programs operationalized in 45 days. And these are the steps. So on March 13th of 2020, President Trump declared a nationwide emergency pursuant to Section 501B of the Stafford Act. To avoid, this avoided governors having to make individual requests for emergency declarations. All 50 states, the District of Columbia, and four territories have been approved for major disaster declarations to assist with additional needs identified under the nationwide emergency declaration for COVID-19. And additionally, 32 tribes are working directly with FEMA under emergency declarations. Many states are using the National Disaster Response Framework, which is closely allied to FEMA, because it provides a flexible structure that enables disaster recovery managers to operate in a unified and collaborative manner, engaging stakeholders from all the critical disciplines. So one of the things I would suggest you do first is to reach out to your emergency manager, whether you're a state official or a county official or a, a city official to find out how needs are being assessed and decisions are being made within your jurisdiction. If there's not a group already meeting, convene one. And this slide gives you some suggestions of the key players you may want to involve. Convening or tapping into a, an existing COVID response group or task force can help you accomplish four goals. Number one, it identifies the existing federal, state, and local resources to address public health, economic, governmental, and human needs. And as Scott referenced, the, the CARES bill has allocations to HHS, SBA, and another a whole variety of federal agencies, and those resources will end up being deployed to states and local governments as well. Secondly, this, working with this kind of a group enables you to prioritize collectively funding resources based on avail availability and need. It helps you to identify areas where there may be resource gaps or insufficiencies of funds, and it avoids duplication of benefits. And, and I wanted to mention it. Uh, Stan mentioned this, references in his presentation too, but for those of you for whom this may be the first time you've used CDB, CDBG under a disaster declaration. The Stafford Act, which is the act that authorizes the president to declare disaster, prohibits the use of assistance from more than one source to meet the same need. So what this requires is a duplication of benefits analysis whenever CDBG funding is used in concert with other funding. This may be likely to come into play more frequently um, if you're considering doing a business loan or a grant program, as any CDBG support could be considered potentially duplicative if your intended beneficiary also receives SBA funds. That said, 
state, local, and nonprofit resources can be potentially duplicative as well. So, so this is your 44-day path to launch on day 45. At the end of this presentation, there are two program examples that, that I'll give you where the, this timing is actually broken down by days. And I think realistically for each step in the path to program launch. Your program scope is gonna be defined on the need that you've identified, but it still must be subject to being an eligible activity and meeting a national objective. In the absence of any waiver, which hasn't come so far, 90% of your funding must meet the low and moderate income national objective. Public comment period has been reduced to five days for action plans and substantial amendments, and HUD has given approval in our current operating environment for virtual public hearings, if that's something you, want, you need to do. As it's highly unlikely that you're gonna be using these funds for construction, the environmental review period may be quite short. In many instances, only requiring a determination that the activity you're proposing is either exempt or categorically exempt, not subject to Part 58. You're gonna to need to decide who's gonna run your program and execute a subrecipient agreement. Any contracted services would need to follow procurement requirements. So as Stan mentioned, using existing subrecipients and maybe amending their agreements whenever feasible may be the best and quickest course of action. Policies and procedures need to be developed. But unless your program is really unique, good examples of policies and procedures can be found on the HUD exchange or by Googling some of the CDBG DR grantees that post their policies and procedures online. And this is assuming you're not already planning on doing a program where you have policies and procedures already in place. The final step, and the most time consuming is staffing up and operation, actually operationalizing your program. So this is, this is going to um, involve deciding what your staffing levels need. Do you need staff augmentation? Do you need an application process? What supplies and materials you might need? And what space are you gonna need in order to be able to conduct your program? Here are some examples um, based on input and questions that we've received from some of our current and, and former clients, these are five programs that could be used to address needs that we're hearing mentioned most often. And, and again, Stan mentioned this in his presentation, as payment of the non-federal non cost share. FEMA is providing assistance to the states in two forms currently. The first is public assistance category B, which is emergency protective measures. And the second is individual assistance in the form of crisis counseling. Now, at the present time, the state share of these costs is 25%. In other words, the states are gonna get a bill from FEMA for 25% of the funds expended to that state in those two categories. Given the strain on state and local resources, CDBG CV can be used to cover the state share as long as the activity is CDBG eligible. Assuming the activity qualifies, oh, um, and, and also there's, there's now a, pr a procedure that HUD has put in place that allows states to adopt the FEMA environmental review, which again will speed up that, that piece of the program. Food banks are a huge need in some communities, and this would be a public service and, and an eligible program, assuming that the activity would qualify as either a new program or an increase in capacity of an existing program. Interim mortgage assistance is eligible as an emergency assistance payment under public services that is capped at three months. And I'll talk in about a little bit more detail about this under a program example later. Many small businesses are experiencing difficulty accessing the SBA resources that are available. And in some communities, um, I understand that um, CDBG programs have, have been used to help prepare those businesses to be more effective in making those applications, pulling together the necessary materials, helping with the, the submission requirements. And finally, there's a business grant program. I originally discouraged using CDBG CD programs due to the vast amount of federal resources that have already been allocated to the three SBA programs. However, as I hear more anecdotal evidence of the lack of success small businesses have had with these programs, 
a program tailored to the local needs in your communities may make sense. And Raquel is going to be discussing these in more detail in her presentation. Waivers. This slide identifies the waivers that have already been granted under the CARES Act. And as, as, as Stanigan mentioned, there may be more coming in the Federal Register notice. It should be noticed that some of these waivers apply to both the CDBG CD allocation and your fiscal 2020 and 2019 regular CDBG allocations. And that guidance that, that Stan referenced is also, I've got a, wimp, a link on this in the last slide of this presentation as well, which gives additional detail on the availability of waivers for these different allocations. And while there are certain things that HUD can't waive, um, some of the things that are listed there in the, in the column on the left-hand side, grantees have had success with data-driven requests for waivers as long as you're not asking to uh, waive one of those statutory requirements. Past history can be a helpful guide in structuring a waiver request. On a quarterly basis, HUD publishes a Federal Register notice with all of the waivers granted during that quarter. A review of this not only provides insight into HUD, how HUD may review a specific waiver request, but also how the grantee justified that request. Virtually all of the waivers are justified with data provided by a grantee. This next slide gives you some examples of the waivers that HUD has granted. Now, I will note that these have all been granted, the ones I'm referencing here have all been granted under CBDGDR. Um, and while this, is, this allocation is not being treated as CDBGDR, I don't think that there would be many that would argue with the characterization that we are in fact in a disaster. So um, one of the things to think about is the removal, and they've done this in the past, this has now become pretty much a general waiver with DR allocations, is the removal of the public benefit cap. Um, it doesn't alter the need for you to track job creation or retention, but it can ease reporting for the program. And there are also waivers um, allied with that that, regard, that relate to how low-income jobs or workers are defined so that income documentation and determination requirements are streamlined. Another one that's become general for um, disaster recovery that we may in fact see with um, the, the FR notice or subsequent allocations is permission for the states to fund programs directly or use subrecipients. This gives them more flexibility with how they deploy their CDBG resources. In some instances, a regional approach may be more effective and faster than providing funding to local units of general government. Um, one recent example that was that presented to us um, was a state who was asking, they have a very strong regional EDO that could very easily run a grant, pro, a business grant program, um, but their smaller communities don't have that capacity. And right now that's not permissible under the current um, CDBG CV allocation. And the final one I'm gonna mention, emergency support for essential public services, wasn't really a waiver, but it was permission granted to a specific grantee under very limited circumstances to enable them to fund public safety activities for a limited duration when their general fund dollars ran out and a FEMA community disaster loan was not an option. I can tell you that this is not a program that HUD loved, um, but uh, as, as Stan mentioned, it never hurts to ask, why not? I can't stress this more. Document what you do and the funds that you're spending. Whether you represent a state, a local government, or an EDO, track and document all of the activities you are now undertaking in response to COVID-19, remembering that in the CARES Act, it doesn't necessarily start with the passage of the act, but you can actually go back and track costs that you incurred before the passage of that act. I suggest thinking about establishing a cost center and charge codes that would allow you to identify and categorize these expenses. They may be reimbursable under CDBG-CV, or they may be able to be used as part of a local cost share for match purposes. Finally, 
here are two examples of process maps that form the path to a 45-day launch. These process maps factor in reasonable timelines for public notice pursuant to the waiver, environmental review given conditions that it's exempt or categorically excluded, and policy procedure and development and pre-launch operational preparations. Remembering again, that with policies and procedures, you don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel. There's probably um, samples out there that you can fairly easily modify to fit the program you, you want to implement. And this, this particular business grant program presumes that you're only providing working capital grants. Anything that would have anything to do with construction would require a much longer timeline for environmental review. This is another program that, that we've had a lot of questions about. Um, this is a process map for an interim mortgage assistance program. Generally, income payments to individuals are not an eligible CDBG activity. However, this program could qualify as an exclusion to the prohibition under 570.207B4. If you want to write that down, that's 570.207B4 as an emergency grant program made over a period not to exceed three consecutive months. These would be, these would be payments made to the provider of things such as housing, rent, or mortgage, or utility payments on behalf of an individual family or a household. But remember that in the absence of a waiver for CDBG CV, the limit on this type of assistance is three months. And to date, only the HOPA program, the Housing Opportunities for People with AIDS, has received an extension to 24 months for this type of assistance. This final slide provides a link to additional HUD COVID-19 information and resources that you might may find helpful. Thanks, and I'm going to turn it back to Eric at this point. Sue, so thank you. Very, very good detailed information in, in terms of really how you, you do get a program launched and, and implemented within that 45-day time frame. So uh, a lot of good resources there. Uh, you know, I think uh, one of your, your comments, which I thought was really good about, hey, look, let's not reinvent the wheel, basically. You can get some really good examples of policies, you know, maybe procedures. Um, this last slide that you have uh, might be a, a good way to get that. If you have anything else uh, in terms of best practices that you could recommend, uh, feel free at the end to, to chime in on that. But, very good, thank you very much. Uh, what we'll do now is uh, transition to our final speaker and that's Raquel Savella. And she's with uh, the National Development Council and she's going to talk uh, about how to use the CDBG funds and how they can be used for economic development projects such as around large uh, metro areas uh, inc including how to really develop a regional strategy and then she'll uh, also kind of underscore how NDC has developed tools for communities, what to do and what not to do when using CDBG funds, and then what are some of the hoops you have to go through uh, to be successful. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Raquel, and uh, thank you very much, Raquel. Thank you, Eric. Um, I think folks who are on the line are going to hear a lot of uh, similar tips here, but I think um, they're important because these resources are scarce. Um, they, they do have a lot of requirements, federal requirements um, that come with them. And so it's important to have a little bit of uh, repetition here on the important aspects of the regulations here. So um, one thing that uh, we've seen happen in a lot of our communities is sort of the desire to sort of set um, a lump sum draw of the CDBG funds to establish a revolving loan fund, a small business loan fund. And of course, as you know, you cannot uh, draw down CDBG funds in a, in a lump sum. And so the tip here is that you can do that with program income. And so if that is your priority, if your priority is to simply get some money on the ground quickly, then perhaps you want to consider um, utilizing program income. And so as 
I get to my case study on a more comprehensive and systematic approach for your needs, sort of a short term and then longer term need, you may want to look at sort of using that program income for establishing your short term um, uh, grant needs, for example. Um, the other is that uh, frankly, CDBG may not be the only source of funds that you use to establish your loan funds. So you could raise capital uh, through other resources. And so much as Sue pointed out, leveraging is important, not just leveraging these other funding sources, philanthropic dollars and other um, funding sources like those coming through the SBA, through the EDA and other federal agencies, but local dollars as well. So any source of funds that are dedicated for small business or economic development can be pulled into this fund. And so you have to know in your design through the assessment of what your community's small business needs are, um, what hasn't been covered already. Again, in order to avoid that duplication of benefits um, as required in the Stafford Act, you want to make sure that you're designing a really specific program that both ensures no duplication of benefit and that allows you to meet the national objectives of the CDBG program. You could consider, for example, uh, prioritizing areas where you already have can establish a presumed benefit because they're, you know, um, areas where you've already designated slum and blight, or you have a neighborhood revitalization strategy area that's been designated by HUD and NRSA. So you can look at that, or you could, um, you know, sort of establish, as you'll see in my case study example, a tiered level of loan products or grant products that could service um, multiple tiers, but reserve your CDBG for a very discrete area uh, that can move quickly onto the ground. Um, and then um, determine what types of loan activities, right, will be covered. What types, uh, is it strictly for working capital? Uh, I wanna highlight here that one of the things that we've been getting a lot of calls about is small businesses that have been really affected by their inability to have their employees telecommute because of the digital divide across you know, communities that have uh, very little to no connectivity to the internet or employees who don't have the systems in place at home. And so the businesses are asking if this is something that could be funded through a CDBG. This is an excellent use of CDBG. So to help a business um, set up telecommuting systems and uh, for their employees so that if it allows them to retain jobs by allowing their employees to move their uh, operations online, this would be perfect. So we had a small community that uh, developed a uh, online platform for all of the retail businesses in a discrete district. And they basically consolidated all of these storefronts on one single website. And now they can all transact via that website. This is an excellent way uh, to utilize CDBG. Again, as Sue pointed out, environmental review is a consideration as you're thinking about the use of the small business loan funds. So it's important for you to consider um, whether uh, the activity is going to require a long-term, you know, an extended environmental review process, uh, especially in the case of any real estate improvements. Um, so I wouldn't discount, by the way, that some of the small businesses are needing uh, to take on some real estate uh, debt, and that's because they might have been a tenant um, where they were currently located, and for you know other reasons, uh, maybe their landlord wasn't able to uh, keep that mortgage, they were already having issues, and so that business is having to move, um, and or part of their resiliency plan is to downsize their uh, business. And so uh, there could be a possibility that there are businesses out there that are looking for real estate loans. So I wouldn't discount that, uh, but you could, again, definitely set up two different types of loan products um, in, with your CDBG program. And then finally, you could include as part of your requirements, uh, training for 
some of the larger loans. If you break this out into sort of, let's say you had grants of under $10,000, maybe you don't require um, in-depth training for that, but if you're going to provide substantial grants or loans of over $35,000, maybe you have an online training program that they're required to take, something that helps them understand um, the debt that they're taking on and that obligation. So we have several at NBC, as you guys probably are familiar with, but we do a lot of cash reign supreme, how to get a loan, those sorts of things that help small businesses understand the responsibility they're taking on. And then, of course, really important, and I can't tell you how many times we go across the country and find out that uh, the fundamental issue is the uh, municipality doesn't really have any policies and procedures in place. So really important for you to have policies and procedures in place, whether the city, the municipality, the grantee is operating the loan fund internally or whether they're doing this through a subrecipient. Um, or a contractor. Really important to make sure that you've got uh, PMPs in place. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit more about this idea of leveraging, because the other thing that is important to understand is that not only do we not want to reinvent the wheel, but now is not the time to uh, decide that you want to undertake uh, becoming a loan officer if you've never done this before. And so if you don't have the infrastructure in place, um, to, to do that, if the, you don't have the capacity in-house to do that, then assess the resources in your marketplace, whether it's within your city or in the broader market area. Are there other loan funds that are already operating, either because they've received EDA funds in the past, SBA funds, CDFI funds, in the greater market, if they've got them, then they already have the infrastructure to do things like the underwriting, to do the loan servicing. All of that is really important. And if you, if somebody in your area already has that system in place, um, you should leverage that. Don't try to recreate that. Then you'll definitely not deploy in 45 days, and you'll definitely not focus the attention on really getting the resources to those minority and women-owned businesses, the people who are least served right now through the CARES Act because they're not banking with the major financial institutions. Um, this also helps uh, bring some level of comfort as you're going out to try to raise capital from um, philanthropic organizations that there's capacity and that there's a track record of deploying this kind of capital and this kind of loan in the marketplace. So. But again, it's not just about leveraging the resources, but also leveraging the expertise of the folks that exist in your market. So uh, I can't overemphasize that. And so um, we actually lo really look at um, establishing a centralized fund administrator. We think it really provides for a, a system that uh, ensures there's compliance, credibility, and capacity. So it helps make sure that everyone is meeting the regulatory requirements of each of those different uh, reporting agencies, depending on what layers of funding sources you're putting into this loan fund, uh, whether it's the SBA, uh, EDA, CDFI, other philanthropic. Um, each donor might have their own goals and their own uh, whether they're expecting a return or not expecting a return, they may have their own requirements, um, either by geographic area or population to serve. So this really tends to attract more of that type of capital. Um, and that way you can focus uh, your energies. You can have other organizations uh, that support these efforts, focus their energy on ensuring that the, this capital flows to the right businesses. Um, also, what happens is that by establishing this kind of system, you're building capacity amongst those trusted organizations, right? So in the example that I'm going to provide for you here for North Texas, um, NBC is really uh, proposing to serve as a uh, fund administrator and our partner next street will sort of provide the project management and coordination um, and then if you look at this, we're 
pulling funding from various different funding sources into this small business recovery system. Um, in this example, we're talking about 17 different cities, from very large cities to cities of populations with 5,000, you know, uh, as small as 5,000. So all types of sizes, but the goal here is that you've got uh, to provide a couple of different things, right? Access to capital and then also technical assistance. On the access to capital side, you're looking at both a grant program, a microloan, and then also a more permanent type of SBA 7A product. And if you look at this on the execution partner side, we're looking at working with local organizations. So there's a there's a piece for every key stakeholder to play in this. So these local business support organizations are grassroots organizations that are already interfacing with the minority and women-owned businesses in the communities that are being hardest hit. And, and we also are considering that there are many CDFIs already operating in this space. And so as businesses are flowing through this um, ecosystem, we're going to make sure that their uh, financing needs are met through this system. And then, as I mentioned, um, we can't uh, be sure that they're not, the businesses are going to be able to deal with future uh, catastrophic events if we can't provide them with some level of advisory services, right? How do we ensure that they can recover and they have some resiliency planning? Um, and then also, how do we build the capacity of the units of government so that in the future, they have the ability to provide technical support and assistance to their small businesses? So this is um, one example of how we built this. It can definitely be scaled up or down depending on the size of community. Uh, this one is in Texas. We're also replicating this um, in two communities in Ohio and then looking at um, large uh, metro areas in California. So this is one example uh, that I wanted to share with everyone. And with that, um, just some contact information. If you have any questions uh, following this webinar, feel free to contact me. Thank you very much. Back to Eric. Raquel, thank you. That was uh, excellent. Some really good tools and that, that case study, I think, kind of really opened up my eyes in terms of what some, some options are for, uh, you know, for our local communities to help um, in working with the CDFIs and, and other organizations. So thank you very much. And I think with, with that, we have uh, just about 12 minutes left and we want to open things up uh, for questions from uh, the attendees for our panelists. And uh, with that, uh, I'm going to just take a, a minute here. A lot of good questions. Uh, there was a question uh, that we had. Uh, let's see here. Uh, inside of how HUD will consider communities for the $2 billion allocation, uh, from what I read, it's based on magnitude of COVID impact. Um, if anyone would like to on the panel uh, talk about that, uh, we have Scott uh, on the line. Uh, and Scott, I don't know if you want to talk about that, but the insight on how HUD will consider communities for the $2 billion allocation or stance. So this is Stan. Um, yeah, there, there's there's language in the CARES Act that says that you know that HUD will develop a formula, but says that uh, uh, and, and gives some discretion to HUD, but it does say they shall prioritize certain factors uh, related to coronavirus. Um, I don't, let me see if I can get that language back in front of me. Um, uh, which is uh, risk of transmission, number of, of cases compared to national average, and economic and housing market disruptions resulting from coronavirus. So uh, a few, uh, few things there for HUD to consider, but they can bring other things into play here as well. Okay, perfect. Uh, anyone else want to uh, 
comment on that from the panel. Okay, so uh, if I can, uh, this is uh, for Scott. Uh, members of Congress have heard from many localities and uh, counties uh, regarding the half million uh, limit for direct funding from Treasury. Uh, is there discussion of lowering that amount to a number of, let's say, uh, 50,000 uh, population as an example? Yeah, so one of the, the sticking points in this current package that's being um, um, discussed now was should we uh, put in more money for state and local governments in this package or can this be something that waits until the next package and one of the reasons was um, the question on how do we allocate that money more efficiently um, and you know the the number was put in at five hundred thousand, and and we run into the issue in um, Columbus, Ohio, where um, Columbus uh, has a population of about I think it's nine hundred thousand, so they they qualify. And Franklin County has a population with uh, probably another three hundred thousand on top of that. Um, but if you take away Columbus out of Franklin County's population, they fall under 500,000 and are no longer eligible. Um, Treasury did make it clear that for counties that did have a large city that made up most of its population, that they could include that, but they, the money wouldn't be double counted. So they'd have to take that population out for, they would get money, but it would just be, um, it would be, uh, the, the proportion now to Columbus would be essentially minus that of what Franklin County got. Um, but no, Congress has definitely heard, and I have personally heard um, from mayors, um, county commissioners from across the country that, uh, you know, if the money is given to the state, it, 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 there's a lot less uh, control and, you know, the mayors and the county commissioners feel like they will not get as much money um, as if they would get from a direct um, direct grant from Treasury. So uh, there's definitely consideration to lowering that number for a next package. Um, what that number is will be more the question. Um, and obviously, you know, I think there are 20,000 town cities across the country. You can't make all of them eligible. It'd just be too much of a, a nightmare for Treasury to track and administer, um, but there, there, there is going to be a balance. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, Scott. That's very, very helpful. And uh, I think we'll have to just kind of wait and monitor and see, see how things kind of unfold. I think um, there's, a, there's a question too, uh, and this probably would be for Raquel and for Stan uh, about seeking a bank loan to establish a loan fund and using CDBG funds to pay the debt service for that. Uh, that came from one of the, uh, one of the attendees. Uh, can, can either one of you address that, that question? Can you seek a bank loan to establish a loan fund and use CDBG funds to pay that debt service? So, um, I'm not sure that that would be beneficial. Um, the cost of funds that you would have on that loan, uh, unless a financial institution is doing it for you, uh, you are probably better off, um, as I said, either utilizing your own program income or um, utilizing your own debt capacity through even 108, for example. Um, but um, you can use uh, CDBG if you want it to. The, the trouble is that you cannot do any lump sum draws, so you would have to qualify the activity that you are funding. And so that's going to be a little troublesome, Stan. Um, I don't know if you want to chime in. It, you'd have yeah. to... Talk, speak a little bit more about the design 
of the program and what you would be covering in that uh, small business loan program. Uh, so this is Stan. Uh, I would uh, I always kind of look at these kind of these questions uh, uh, from two standpoints uh, for CDPG purposes. One, you know, what is the eligible activity you're carrying out? And two, what is the national objective you're going to achieve? And this one stumbles on the first question. What's the eligible activity? Because in essence, it's the payment of debt service. And there's only some very limited circumstances in which you can do that in the CDBG program. So I, I would go a step further here and say, right now, this is not a, a, an eligible activity. It is the kind of issue you could take to HUD and request a waiver, uh, either regulatory, uh, but I really think this one's a statutory waiver, which means that HUD would have to consider it and put it in a federal register notice. Uh, again, I think this one has an eligibility question. Thank you, Stan. Thank you. So moving moving on in terms of uh, another question that came up, the, this is for all the panelists, if you like. Uh, this, the use of CDBG funds for a loan to a business then preclude them from receiving another federally supported loan. And this could be a double dipping, uh, be avoided if the funds are used really for a different time period or any or, or another purpose. Uh, so can you guys touch on, on how, how community might address that question? Yeah, let me, let me take a start. Oh, okay. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I was just going to say that, that that really is a duplication of benefits issue that I think uh, several of us have talked about that makes this funding a little trickier because it is operating under a national disaster declaration. So it the way it's defined is you can't use different sources of funding for the same need. So there would have to be a duplication of benefits analysis conducted to use CDBG funds. And if the other funding that a beneficiary was getting was for a different need or in a different time period, that would be not necessarily duplicative, but you would definitely have to document that. And, and by the way, just as another note, um, grantees can get direct fees and should request them if they're gonna do any kind of a beneficiary program directly from FEMA, and from the SBA, because when you're monitored, um, HUD is going to look at how you documented that there was or was not a duplication of benefits existing. And while you can get a letter, a loan letter from a, a beneficiary that says, I got, you know, $10,000 in SBA money, um, that's going to need to be verified with a direct feed from SBA. Thank you, Sue. Uh, and then was it Raquel? Did, were you going yes. to say something as well? Okay. Yes. There's actually a great toolkit that has a sample triage um, sheet on the HUD resource exchange um, to help you sort out duplication of benefits. And so I would encourage you to take a look at that um, because it does help you sort of walk through how uh, to document that there is no duplication of benefits. Okay, great, great. Thanks. Good. Another good resource for people. So I, I think we're uh, right on schedule. Uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, if there are no other questions, uh, but if there are, uh, please put them in the chat, and we'll make sure that we get them out to the panel. But while we're doing that, um, I would like to give our panelists. Uh, another minute just to kind of have some concluding comments about from today and then some takeaways uh, from each uh, each panelist. So I'm going to turn it over to Stan and then uh, we'll move on to Scott, and Sue, and, and Raquel. Okay, I had to take myself off of mute there. <laughs> but uh, uh, again, you're, the reality here is uh, everybody who is tasked with uh, managing these funds at, out there at the uh, state and local level have real challenges. Uh, you're facing great needs. 
uh, I can uh, fully imagine the pressure you're getting from your elected officials to uh, be proactive and to get those dollars out the door. Uh, and you should make every effort to get those dollars out the door quickly. Uh, kind of come back to the idea that uh, you have to look uh, look in the mirror a little bit and ask yourself, how can we best meet those needs and uh, still be uh, you know, sure that we're using the money in, the, in, a, in a correct and appropriate manner? Uh, again, not just with regard to the, uh, the regulatory or statutory requirements, but from a public perception uh, standpoint. So uh, think hard as you uh, go to uh, use these dollars. Uh, be talking to one another, uh, as you've heard throughout uh, this, uh, this webinar, that uh, uh, there's an awful lot of resources out there to, to look at, to get ideas for how to do things. Uh, there's um, you know, a number of different associations, most, you know, ID, IEDC, you know, foremost among them, uh, with good ideas on how to uh, deploy CWG in support of economic development activities, make use of those resources, be talking to people, ask questions. Uh, don't, don't operate in a vacuum because uh, other people are out there facing the same problems and the exchange of information amongst uh, everybody involved can only uh, help improve the end product. And uh, I wish everybody the best of success in uh, uh, getting these dollars out the door, both with the first tranche and the, and the points to come. So thank you. Thank you, Stan. Scott, any final words uh, from, from you from the house? Sure. Um, so all I would say is, you know, I think obviously, obviously everyone on this call knows that, uh, you know, there are people hurting all over this country in every community. Um, you know, this, this money, while there are a lot of rules and regulations, it is very flexible. Um, so I would encourage you all to, you know, be creative. One of the things that I like about City VGR is there are no uh, trade secrets or there's no, um, you know, secret sauce that um, one locality hides from another. You know, if, if one community comes up with a good idea, uh, you know, you might get a press hit or it gets shared widely and then a community across the country could replicate that idea because you know, no matter what community you work in, I guarantee you there are hundreds of communities that are similarly situated um, that, you know, could use some good ideas or you should be looking to them for good ideas and uh, if something works in one area, uh, it could very well work in yours and there's no shame. And, in copying that uh, in order to get results. Um, there are homeless shelters that are overrun right now that can't stay on, can't stay running during the day. Um, there are, uh, you know, hotels, motels, convention centers that remain empty that, um, you know, could be repurposed, rehabbed. I mean, there's, I just encourage everyone to be creative. Um, and there's certainly not a, a lack of need out there in the community. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Sue from Michigan, Can, any parting words? We'll come back to Sue. Uh, Raquel? Yes, um, just one other item that I uh, failed to mention was we, we talked a little uh, before, but just to make sure that you're not, as a grantee, somehow thinking that your requirements in CDBG go away by passing on your funding through a subrecipient agreement to a nonprofit organization. All of the requirements of CDBG follow. So I've heard in other uh, webinars and local presentations where organizations think that by make uh, grantees believe that by making uh, an award to a subrecipient sort of some of the federal requirements go away. They do not. Um, so make sure that you're, you're understanding that these, these requirements remain in place through subrecipient agreement. Thanks, Raquel. And, and uh, Sue? Uh, Sorry, you... I was on mute. Oh, that's okay. That's <laughs> I just, okay. Um, I, I just wanted to reiterate what you've heard. I, it's flexible funding. Um, I think what you're going to find is that there's um, there's resources already coming into your community from other places, but there's some 
very definite gaps or insufficiencies in funding. And I really believe that it's possible to get those, those funds moved in 45 days. There are some phenomenal tools on the HUD exchange, um, which several of my colleagues have mentioned already. Um, and I'll put my contact information on our slide and please feel free to reach out to me if you think we can be helpful. Um, any questions you have on things like where to find policies and procedures, um, we certainly would be happy to do that. So I wish you all the best of luck and stay safe and stay well in your communities. And this is the other thing I, I just want to mention is that it's, it's, it's so clear to me that this has been such a challenge in terms of just being able to function as a governmental unit. Some of the communities with whom I'm working now are not used to telecommuting. And so, um, you know, we all have to kind of find better ways and different ways and innovative ways to work together to help people. So thanks. Great, great comments. Thank you, Sue, and, and really thanks to all the panelists. And I want to thank IEDC for really taking a good leadership role in uh, getting a lot of relevant, timely information out to uh, all of its members at IEDC. So thanks to Jeff Finkel and the entire IEDC team for putting these webinars on. Uh, again, just to reiterate, go to uh, restoreyoureconomy.com uh, uh, and you can find uh, really good information uh, from IEDC. Uh, or actually, .org, I apologize. RestoreYourEconomy.org is a great resource. Uh, keep going to that because updates are being put on there uh, every day. So with that, uh, everyone be safe, and thanks again for your time today. Have a great day.